Uh, I think getting getting bogged down or getting uh, getting carried away. These 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 can be very good things. Um, it means, it means something's happening. But at the same time, uh, I do want to try to <coughs> put as much into the mix as possible. So I'd like to push into this text a bit farther and, uh, and bring more questions to bear. And <coughs> ultimately, I'd like to try to bring us to consider the, this, this peculiar way in which the work is working. What I called earlier a, a folding, um, and, and I alluded some time ago to, uh, to a notion of rhythm. Um, and that was not a good sentence, but you'll see the kinds of things I'm trying to get toward, and we're not even close to that yet, because we haven't even touched upon the question of truth. Let me just summarize very quickly where we have just been. The Heidegger has described the setting up of a world, the Aufstellung, as entailing the establishment of a form of measure. And I went very quickly over this, and I, I think I'm going to just leave it uh, where it is, because this is a question I think requires a tremendous amount of attention. In as much as, in my, my sentences, I was hearing myself do it, I'm sort of conjoining this Heraclitian set of, of, of existentials, um, holy, unholy, birth, death, victory, disgrace, and so forth, all of these things um, which, which Heidegger says are being articulated in a people's world, in, in, in the language of that people and in the art of that people. That's, let's just, let's just call that ethical, uh, but I, I, that word just strikes me as, as really quite, quite inadequate here. That ethical, um, configuration, that establishment of, it's not value, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's establishment of standards. So that, that ethical determination is at the same time a spatio-temporal um, determination. That's to say, as, as you say, when, when the artwork sets up a world, it's setting up a, a spaciousness, as he puts it. A spaciousness and a measure, as I said, in a temporal sense. There's a hastening and a lingering, and, and, and it's defining the way in which Beings are present to us, or we are present to beings, and the the sight of that presence. So it is. Um, it's, it's, I can only call it spatio-temporal because it is both spatial. He speaks of spatial spaciousness, but it is also temporal, in the sense that there is this, as he says, this lingering and hastening. And in Heidegger, there's always a profound temporal dimension to this uh, this way of, of of dwelling or inhabiting. So, we have in this um, conjunction of these existential, this, this measure understood in an existential sense or an ethical sense, that's being conjoined with, um, as I said, a spatiotemporal determination in this reference to a form, or and which I call the hegemon, which establishes the right, or the, even the correct, to some extent. Um, there is a, a kind of a hegemonic determination of <coughs> standards, if you will, or a measure. The word he likes to use here is a measure. There's a setting of measure. This word measure, you could pursue it. I notice there's a, the Nietzsche lectures next to me here on the, on the table. He has some wonderful pages on measure, um, and particularly um, through a meditation on, out from Nietzsche's med meditation on Anaximander. Um, uh, I think Parmenides as well is in there. Um, in any case, this is a this is a term that that's very important to Heidegger and um, and is very important in his reading of Nietzsche at this point. But so the, the, in the setting up the world, there is this, there is a setting of measure, which is this is both ethical and spatiotemporal. But this is occurring as he insists, and he insists, I think, um, uh, perhaps most importantly in this passage, there is this setting up. Or is occurring on the earth, which is set forth in the same way. And what's at stake here, and I'm just trying to summarize our discussion from a few moments ago, what's at stake is he tells us in that paragraph that ends with the italics, the work lets the earth be an earth, be an earth, is human dwelling in the world, the possibility of something like dwelling. And for Heidegger that is how he defines ethos in the letter on human. We, we understand ethos from the way in which humankind dwells. And as he cites, he cites Hölderlin in there, he cites Hölderlin throughout this period of the 30s, he insists poetically man dwells. Um, I'm citing the, the, the German, so I have to use the, the gendered 
reference to humankind, but poetically man dwells. So there is, a, by a poiesis, there is the possibility of something like a human ethos and a human dwelling. And that, as he, as he is insisting here, requires the earth. Now, as we go on in the next paragraph, um, there's, a, I think, a, a strong suggestion that what, is, what he's trying to recover here is something that the, this, this order of relations that he calls technique, um, and, and it's really, it's something on the order of, it's not just a, it's not technology in the narrow sense, it's rather the structure of our relation to being. Technique is, is, is the way in which being is given in the modern period. So this is not something that um, is, is, is simply delimited in our um, experience, it's something more like the element of our experience. So it's not a matter of turning away from technique or uh, choosing something else. No, uh, technique is, is that, is that uh, sort of the element in which we're dwelling. But within technique, there is the preeminence of uh, the uh, a rational calculation, and the, um, what, what Heidegger calls, following Leibniz and others, the, the project of, ma um, of modernity, which is a mathematical project. Um, and, and so he is he's attempting to, um, to, to suggest that in the modern conception of reason, in the modern ratio, if you will, um, there is a, um, a well a kind of a limitation, and or worse than a limitation, this this uh, furthering of the mathematical project is actually foreclosing um, something else, which is of course the earth. Um, and again, what's at stake is the question of dwelling, and it's the question of human dwelling. And so um, here in this paragraph on the earth, he's Stressing, I think, um, importantly, again, the notion of experience. He's trying to say we can we can give a very precise determination of the uh, uh, you know the, the different um, uh, parameters of our of our being uh, uh, you know with with, with a calculation, a mathematical calculation of of every dimension of our physical existence. Um, but that is still to miss our, our experience of beings in the world, and which entails this earthly dimension of, of being. So what is it, you know, each time he mentions this, we, we, the, the, we can break the rock apart, but we've completely missed the burden that rock represents. And the burden is, a, you know, is again, a, um, has to be understood existentially. And what he's referring to is the experience of rock. And, so and I think when we're talking about this, what's at stake in art for Heidegger, again coming back to this question, why, why, why art, why, why, do, why do we need art for truth? Um, what's at stake is the question of experience itself. Uh, you know, Heidegger is, you know, he's, he's very much in, the, in his time, uh, you know, after uh, Spengler and, and others, talking about the destruction of human experience. Benjamin was talking about this. Um, uh, Baudelaire had talked about it in the mid-century. So Blake. Uh, Blake. Blake, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, with the onset of the Industrial Revolution, everybody is scared, scared to death of what's happening to human experience, particularly in the urban context. And, you know, this, is, this becomes a um, massive ideological motif, and, you know, fought over in various ways. But it's fought over from left and right, and, and the question is, what's happening to experience? And, and I think that in some respects, Heidegger is addressing this issue via um, the question of art. And, and that's, again, why it's so critical, this distinction between understanding art as involving elebnis, lived experience in the sense of, of feeling and uh, the self's um, experience of the world, and erfahrung as, um, as this more objective, <laughs> if you will, uh, but this, um, this, more, uh, this more founded, I'd say, um, experience of, of being, more founded in the sense of dwelling, which he's trying to describe here. He's, he's trying to describe the way in which the, a, a people um, defines for itself the grounds of its being. And those grounds are both in terms of the measure uh, to which I alluded in talking about world, and at the same time this, uh, this way in, of living with and upon the earth. Um, so I'm living with that ambiguity, but living also with that strange way in which the earth presences as 
um, self-sufficient, as untiring, uh, um, and, and uh, in a certain sense as, as securing to some extent. But this has to be drawn forth. Um, Marcus, I think you were talking about Levinas yesterday. And, um, Levinas, yeah, he does point to this question of gathering, but I think Levinas is even more concerned with the question of rootedness. Very concerned with the way he perceives Heidegger as seeking a notion of a native soil and a, a rooted existence in a place. Um, and Levinas, uh, you know, a good Jewish thinker, doesn't have too much to do with nature. Um, but, uh, you know, he's, he's particularly concerned with this, um, you know, this, this ultra conservative um, idea that. Um, people would have its place, you know, in a place on the earth. And I, I think that, you know, certainly Levinas is, um, is sensitive to something in Heidegger that is, you know, is, is a real problem but, and a real question. Um, but again, this text is telling us that there, this is, the earth only becomes a native ground by virtue of poiesis. The earth is not naturally uh, um, our native ground, so to speak. Um, so there is not a natural rooting um, for a people. That, that, that rooting has to be achieved, <coughs> in Heidegger's view. It has to be achieved by this poetic um, process which he's describing, by which there can be something like a dwelling. So, he's certainly not a nomadic thinker. He's talking about this gathered dwelling upon the earth. Um, but the, the, um, the capacity to achieve that dwelling entails this act of the artist of going out and receiving a relation, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, to truth, which is, you know, and again, he's reading Holden in this time. It's a little bit like exposing yourself to lightning. It's, you know, you might not survive. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. Holden <laughs> says this very explicitly. I think maybe I've received a little too much, um, and and he, you know, and he, and he goes crazy. Um, but Heidegger is not um, insensitive to that. And as he reads Holden, and he's talking about the you know, uh, going, the artist's act of going out, exposing himself or herself to, to a radical alterity and then um, thinking their relation to their home from, from that ground. So it's a homecoming is not a, you know, a simple pastoral <laughs> retreat. On the contrary, there is, this is a very um, dynamic um, process. And if we think about Holden, and again, uh, we have to keep in mind that chiasmic structure whereby uh, we are repeating in the Greeks what the Greeks themselves could not quite get hold of in order to uh, to come closer to what is specific to our modernity. Um, I, I probably, I, I hope I can come back to that because that's, that's really quite extraordinary stuff and it's very pertinent here. But I want to push forward in the text a little bit. So the question is human dwelling, human experience, and then at some even, even more uh, it's difficult to define level the question of the essence of the human, um, which, which I've been just pointing to, but Heidegger isn't, isn't doing <laughs> even that um, with the notion of Stimmung and, and the relation to the earth. There's an earthly dimension to the human essence that Heidegger is, I think, trying to um, make us attentive to, and perhaps that he himself is not quite sure how to work with you. The, he has just been talking about the relation between equipment and art. And uh, he tells us in that previous passage, and he'll tell us over again, equipment uses the material um, that from which it's fashioned in such a way as to use it up, that is to say, to, ex to exhaust the material presence into the functionality of, of the equipment. Um, this in itself is not a bad thing. It's, he's not condemning this. He's simply saying that equipment uses um, the earthly elements in a different way from uh, art's use of it. And art's use is, is one that um, doesn't use up and certainly doesn't exhaust. It's not a verbrauch, and it's a gebrauch. It's a usage which um, allows this earthly dimension to come forth as itself. The rock, as we read a moment ago, comes to bear and rest, and so first becomes rock. Right? The language becomes language. Color becomes color. So there is a, um, a way in which art serves the earth to allow it to be what it is. And then we have, in that italics, the work lets the earth be an earth. So that's a use of the earth, he's telling us. The, the, artist, the art uses the earth in such a way as to let the earth be. 
And here we have, I, I think this is, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first really consequent and insistent development on Heidegger's part of the notion of usage. And interestingly enough, it's happening in relation to the question of Earth. And as I tried to present it uh, two days ago, <coughs> I was um, emphasizing that it's via this notion of usage that Heidegger tries to recover the question of the human. That the human is used in a Heidegger for the um, advent of language. So, interestingly enough, when the question of usage really comes to the fore, here in the artwork essay, it's about Earth. And then it will become, as, as, he, um, you know, as he talks about the question concerning technology and art, the issue is how the human is used in Erragnus for the event of truth and language and so forth. So, again, there's a very strong hint that what we're looking at here with this notion of usage has something to do with the human. Um, even though, as he tells us in his addendum, it, it hasn't quite worked out. You know, he hasn't, he hasn't quite got it. But, but we're following here something really quite, in a certain sense, quite primordial in Heidegger's thinking. He's trying to get to a dimension of the human which is utterly foreclosed in, in modern humanism and the modern uh, metaphysics of subjectivity by virtue precisely of this technical um, determination of, of experience which he's pointing to. Okay, so that's, that takes us to... What well, would you... So the, the human and the earth, they share something in the, in the sense that they're being, of the, relate, being the use of relation. Is it kind of like a materiality? There is a materiality in this human essence. Yes. And also, that this is what human and earth share. In some sense. Yes. Yes. I, 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 yes. I mean, it's, and it's very difficult to say this in words that are appropriate, but that's right. Yeah. He's interested. You know, when I, um, one way of talking about this human that I that I said is, is exceeds the the humanist understanding of humanity. Um, one way I talk about it is to say that there is something of the human, or something in human beings, lends itself to the event of truth. Something about the human, the human being somehow lends itself to be a site to truth. And you know, it, it's it, and you talked about this from the very beginning. That's the Dasein in man, right? That's the, there is there is for some reason there is in the, in humankind a kind of breach. Or an opening. There is a. There is a. There's the human. The human, by essence, is exposed. There, there's an exposure. Is this what the romantic poets were doing is in, in some in the same way. Some romantic poets, uh, Hollerin certainly, and yeah. you see this in Wordsworth. Words, no, yeah, I, I mean, so you take. Uh, is this like a philosophical? You take Wordsworth's words spots of time, for yeah. example, um, and these are, are I think, um, working through precisely what what Heidegger is talking about. But this is a big jump. Yeah. But, I, but I do agree with you, except that at the same time, the, the, the romantic, you know, the, the cliched notion of romanticism gives, gives us a lateness rather than yeah, yeah. a foul. Yeah. Um, but, but the human being, what, character, what, what, what makes the human human is this way in which we, we are exposed. Um, that, that there is this opening there and, and we become a site for this event, which is the occurrence of truth. She says it's proper to humans. And again, this is a big question. What about the relation of humans and animals and so on and so forth? But no, for, for Heidegger, it's by, by virtue of this human essence and the relation to language, which again he attributes to humankind, um, there, is this, there is this opening. There is this, there's this, there's, you can use all sorts of words, a breach, um, you know, a, a, an exposure, a, a gap, you know, various ways of talking about the way in which humankind opens to something beyond it. And hence, there is this possibility of transcendence. So he starts from human being, the exist existence, you know, in, in the existential analytic. But what he's interested in is that in human being there is this exposure to alterity. There is an opening to something beyond the human, and that's um, that's what the artist is is in a certain sense working through. So I, I've I've taken us then up to um, uh, the middle where where we have been before, the middle page forty seven. The last sentence I read, I think, was the earth appears openly cleared as itself only when it is perceived and preserved as that which is by nature undisclosable, that which shrinks from every disclosure and constantly keeps itself closed up. And then he continues with a fascinating statement. All things of earth 
and the earth itself as a whole flow together into a reciprocal accord. You're always a page ahead of us. Okay. Is that 47 then? Most of the time, yeah, about 46. 46. 46. 46. 46. 46. First paragraph. Yes, 47. Okay. I'm also looking for my German. It's around here somewhere, but I don't know. Yeah. I just have to work from memory. I don't know why the German is. Um, I think that must be Einstein. All things of earth and the earth itself as a whole flow together into a reciprocal accord. But this confluence is not a blurring of their outlines. Here there flows the stream, restful within itself, of the setting of bounds, which delimits everything present within its presence. Thus in each of the self-secluding things, there is the same not knowing of one another. The earth is essentially self-secluding. To set forth the earth means to bring it into the open as the self-secluding. So, he's added something here quite, quite important. There, there is in the earth this tendency to hide, you know, using the Heraclitian phrase, physics could just don't feel like. It hides, it keeps itself closed up, it shrinks, it withdraws, it pulls back, there is a, a, a darkness to it, an opacity to it. Um, but at the same time, in that shrinking back, in this, in the, which he's now naming a movement of self-seclusion, there is a delimitation. So there is a, a you wouldn't say a bordering, but a, you know, something like a bordering. There, there, there is a, um, a, a delimiting of things, but that bordering, or that limit, or that, uh, um, or that, that, that marking off is not a relation as yet. Not a relation in the sense of the world's relation. There is a chord, there's Einstein, there is a harmony perhaps of some kind, reciprocal chord in this confluence. But it is, it's not a relational structure because these things don't know one another. Right? So, the way I try to understand, I've never done better, better than to understand that when the artist opens the world, uh, or tries to set up a world, and draws out this defining measure, what I call the Higemon, um, when, when the artist traces this form, what he or she is doing is remarking those limiting movements in Earth. So he's, he's remarking the limit, or the, you know, the, the boundary, in such a way as to appear as a limit. So that the boundary now is a relation between one thing and another thing. The artist is, is taking that withholding character of Earth, which is, which is present in each thing, in, in, in singular ways, taking that and um, drawing it out into a relation. So it's not a matter of you know inscribing in Earth you know in, you know tearing it open in a in a um, in an initiatory way you know of imprinting or ripping open rather it's a it's a moving in and with this way in which Earth pulls itself back and delimits itself and but at the same time there is a certain amount of violence as he'll tell us in this act of remarking or um, uh, and delimiting these these limits. Delim de delimiting is very nice because there's a there's a kind of private in that privative in that D. So the, the in the in the Earth's movement there's limiting, but when it's delimited by the, the artist's act of remarking that limit as such, the, the, the limit is slightly undone. <laughs> you know, it's, it's delimited to allow the opening, which, which is this uh, relation relational structure of truth. So the um, you know he adds here in addition to this to these various ways of talking about the the earth's coming forth but in a reserved way now he, he suggests that there is a limiting and suddenly he gives us this image of the stream of, 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 a, of a, a stream and a flowing 
which is which then again would link us immediately to um, the reflection on Hamlet's mm -hmm. dreams in this period of 1932 and 33, and again take us to the question of the uh, Stimmung of the artist. So, the arts, the uh, the artists act then is uh, I would suggest to remark this withholding character of Earth in such a way as to draw out a relationality which takes within itself all of those relations that, that you know, which I described as existential or ethical and at the same time entail this spatio-temporal um, measure. Okay? And then he, so he then describes it a little bit later on. Um, I'm jumping ahead here where I'm sorry, I'm not sure where that is exactly, but there's a phrase that it comes up in the course of the subsequent section where he says, the artist draws the, the opposition of measure and boundary into a common outline. The, me the opposition, measure, world, earth, boundary, the artist draws a common outline, which, as I'm trying to suggest, remarks the bounding character of earth in such a way as to Give, to give it as a limit, so because a limit marks a relation between an inside and outside, or self and other, or because, one thing and another thing. Because before that limit is drawn, there are different registers. Yeah. So that, yeah. And so I think register is a good word for the difference between Earth and the world before the, before the limit is... I don't even really know what it means, but somehow if they're totally... You can't compare things in different registers. Yeah. The relation requires limit. Yes. 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 Well, yes. Yeah. So, what did you say? What I mean, could one say that this is also like a remarking of the uh, finitude of origin, or maybe the origin of finitude? The, the origin here, the Ursprung, is the difference traced out. Because it's what he's going to tell us is that this. I'm again citing later on. The, the artist draws the opposition between measure and boundary, world and earth, into a common outline. That common outline is the tracing of the difference between these two. So, you know, I, I saying that the, I'm saying that the artist remarks the earth you know, own bounding in such a way as to draw forth a limit, but we must think that limit itself as the tracing of a difference which is the oppositional, uh, in, at this point in, in the text, he's saying it's the opposition of world and earth. As we go forward, he's going to say that opposition has to be thought more profoundly as the opposition between concealment and unconcealment. And the world is not simply unconcealing, earth is not simply concealing. Both world and earth entail that play insofar as they're drawn into relation with one another. And so we have to move then to, as we begin to think the truth of this event, we have to move to another level. And, it, and once we start to think the relation between concealing and unconcealing, then we're starting to think different. And there's the Ursprung. So the artist is drawing out the Ursprung. And again, as I told you, the Sprung is a cleft. It's a, it's a, it's a rift. And, they, and it, he names that outline, Aufriss. Um, and you hear in Riss, that, that rift. So it's, um, yes, it, it, it is um, tracing, the artist is tracing the Ursprung. But the tracing is, is I, at the same time of creating. Yes, this is a this is a creative act, if you will. Yeah, because you create. I mean, for there to difference, but means you, that you are, ca are capable of the the, the the difference are of the same are comparable in some mm -hmm. way. So the the demarcation puts them into the same register, so that there can be a difference because there is no difference. Yes. Joe's relation. Mm. You know, I, I would phrase your initial phrase more precisely and say, creating is tracing. <laughs> that, mm. that, that is the, that's what's happening. It's, it's, and, and, and so, it, Heidegger, I, I emphasize this word tracing, and, and it's his own, it, he'll come to it later when he uses this word alphas. And he's going to tell us it, that this, this word names <coughs> this essencing that's going on in art. And so this happening. <coughs> <clears throat> and then later on he'll tell us it's that that word names the origin, the essence of language itself. 
Now, he uses this word um, very insistently, and he's pulling together a series of terms with it. Um, he's pulling together a notion of ziehen, which is a pulling, and also reißen, which is a tearing, and that links to rissen, um, which, which evokes a kind of uh, inscription or tracing, as well as a, a tearing. And Heidegger always works with, um, always, frequently works with, I mean, this is a kind of metaphor, metaphors of, of a marking, or uh, you know, like literally traits or traces. Right? Um, it, it really is that there is a, a very powerful tendency in him to think about um, the, 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 the movement of essencing as a tracing of characteristic traits. So the, 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 the being of a thing is defined, is, is characterized in a certain sense in it by its essence. And he thinks in terms of, you know, a kind of line in this. But the line is, is um, itself has to be understood dynamically as both an opening and a drawing together and a, and a, des and a des describing of a limit. So it is a, um, you know, he's constantly thinking in, in terms of this, um, this tracing out or marking out. But again, it's a dynamic process. And yet it is, it is very insistent, but it's, it's kind of, um, <clears throat> okay, so he comes back now in the following paragraph to insist that the sculptor and the artist is not using up earth, but using it in such a way as to draw it forth. And I mean, it's it's it's, it's I, again. I, I have the feeling almost that this is this is his, perhaps his key point that that the that the, in the artwork, the earth is set forth in such a way as to bring it forth as earth. And where this relation is drawn forth um, in, a, in a composed work, then we have a composed uh, being there. And he describes this, 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 this conflict that is being uh, drawn out between world and earth is actually, he says, a repose. And that comes in the, in the following page, page 48 of my text. But in the essential features just mentioned, if our account has any validity at all, we have indicated in the work rather a happening in no sense of repose, for what is rest if not the opposite of motion? Do you see where I am with that? Heidegger is, um, I mean, here is one point where I think rhythm works very nicely to try to talk about um, a, a, a movement that has the appearance of a kind of repose, or is experienced as a kind of repose, even though it is quite actively working. Um, so, okay, he, he has, he's now in a certain sense, drawn them together, or he's told us that the art draws them together. And in this drawing together, they are, he tells us, being brought into their respective essential nature. World becomes essentially world, earth becomes essentially earth. And, and, and they, as he tells us in the next page, um, you see the paragraph that begins, the opposition of world and earth is a striving. He wants to insist that... You know, it's, it's of the nature of our effort to open a world that, um, you know, we demand openness, right? We demand that things be brought into our, our meaning uh, giving. <coughs> um, if in, in the context of, of our worldly relations, um, in a sense, everything has to have meaning. Everything has to be, um, in some way, part of this world. Um, so world is demanding disclosure. But insofar as the world only opens and becomes itself on the basis of the earth, um, it's, it is always struggling with another dimension of itself, which is this um, uh, ten tendency of earth to with withdraw and to withhold itself. So there's a, there's a conflict and striving. And the artist, as he draws out this relation, is drawing out this striving, this conflict. Here he is, and he's appealing to Heraclitus. He's, um, and he's in some ways, you know, he's very much of his moment talking about strife struggle, conflict, and so forth. He is uh, he's saying that the essence of this event is, is, one of, is an agon, is a, is a struggle. But it's a struggle that is drawn into a uh, kind of repose, or as he tells us in this paragraph, an intimacy 
Here again, he's using a Hölderlin word. Um, this is Hölderlin's Innigkeit. Um, it, it is uh, he's trying to describe the the curious self subsistence and con self containment of the work, the way in which it seems to uh, gather into uh, gather. This is the gathering. This is the movement of gathering. Uh, gather into a harmonious uh, or self-contained unity. There's a curious um, thing happening here, I'd say, in that um, Heidegger seems to be, and perhaps particularly in that he's drawing so heavily upon pre-Socratic sources here, there seems to be a kind of myth-making going on. This um, poiesis is um, seemingly a mythopoiesis, right? If, if we can say that Heidegger is himself being somewhat poetic in this process. Um, there is a mythopoiesis. Listen to the end of the paragraph from which I've just been reading. In the struggle, each opponent carries the other beyond itself. Thus the, and this is very Nietzschean also. Thus the striving becomes ever more intense, the striving and more authentically what it is. In fact, the word he's using here is they, each opponent asserts itself or affirms itself and uh, two sentences earlier, you see, you see the reference to self-assertion of nature. This word is Selbstbehauptung, mm -hmm. and uh, self-affirmation, self-assertion. This is the word he used to entitle his rectoral address when he talked about the university seizing its own essence in the conflict of students and faculty, and he called it the Selbstbehauptung der Deutschen Universität, the self-affirmation, self-assertion of the German university. Again, under the sign of Nietzsche, but in a, you know, with, with a notion of polemos, or struggle, or strike, which is very, very politically uh, overdetermined in this moment. Why, why does the earth strive toward the world? Listen. Oh, sorry. Thus the striving, beca no, because it's coming in the sentences yeah, I want to read. Yeah. Thus, in the struggle, each opponent carries the other beyond itself. Thus the striving becomes ever more intense as striving, and more authentically what it is. World wants to open, but earth in it is disclosing, so world struggles more to, to open and becomes more itself as opening in, in nature. Earth, against this, this demand to open, resists all the more, becomes more earth in resisting. If it wants to be open, why does it conceal itself in the first place? Well, but listen, listen. <laughs> the more the struggle overdoes itself on its own part, the more inflexibly do the opponents let themselves go into the intimacy of simple belonging to one another. The earth cannot dispense with the open of the world if it... it it itself is to appear as Earth in the liberated surge of its self-seclusion. And this is your question, why does the Earth want to appear? Isn't that a, isn't that a worldly... <laughs> why does the Earth have a drive to appear? The world, again, cannot soar out of the Earth's sight if as governing breadth and path of all essential destiny it is to ground itself on a resolute foundation. Well, again, part of what's going on here is you cannot think world or Earth apart from one another, ultimately. It, it, it is a, it's an abstraction to think of them um, as independent uh, agents, even though this process is drawing out a kind of independence of essence or, you know, in, in the self-assertion. But what is really curious here is they do start to sound almost like agents. And, and this is why I, I said there's a kind of mythic um, movement here. The world, it's as though world is an agent. It's so Earth is an agent. And, or like powers, right? Or, um, uh, almost, uh, I don't want to say cosmic powers, but, um, you know, forces in, a, in a, almost a pre-Socratic sense. So, I mean, this could be rather troubling for us, I think, um, at this moment in, of the essay, were it not for the fact that it's, in, in, just, a, in just a moment, he's, he's going to define this movement as the event of truth, and then when he tells us how truth occurs, he starts going into this language of tracing. And, you know, this ex extraordinarily abstract, um, well, abstract in, in many ways. Um, abstract in that our space is it's, it's almost incomprehensible as a word. I mean, there's something very abstract about this. So he goes from the mythopoeic evocation of this, you know, uh, conflict of, of powers to this very precise uh, description of how the artist draws out this uh, this, this difference. And, and I think, in a certain sense, you, you know. I'm not quite sure how to evaluate that mythic dimension here, but it seems, it's seemingly, I wouldn't say it's undone, but there's an extraordinary alternation of tones as he goes from the mythic to the description of the artist's uh, writing out and tracing. And so so it's, a very, it's very interesting the way he's staging here, you know, in this, 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 as I say, this, this 
performance that, that is this text. And right here, it's, um, you might want to suggest it getting a bit carried away. But, um, and this is precisely the way he got carried away in the rectoral address, you know, and, and in, in, in the Nietzschean uh, language, which he became so heady for him. You know, so. <laughs> but, um, but at the same time, you know, it's, he's trying to, again, he's trying to recover human experience. He's trying to get past the metaphysics of subjectivity. So he's going back into pre-Socratic uh, language to, you know, to try to, to call up a, a muthos, a power in language, um, the, the zaga, you know, that, that will allow for him to, to release something that may perhaps the, 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 the rational, the technical language of metaphysics won't allow. Um, there was a question. Yes? Is this something about his use of the term resolute? Isn't, isn't that an important term? It's a very, yeah, and again, this is it's an extremely ambiguous term because there's a, uh, it's a resolute decision which Heidegger will always tell you, this is what I was talking about in being in time, he says. That the, um, the Dasein, to be authentic, and this is word, uh, this authentic versus inauthentic. If the Dasein is to recover its own being, and that's what authenticity is, um, to, be, to be in some sense faithful to its being, whereas inauthenticity is to allow oneself to be taken up with affairs in the world. Um, if the Dasein is to be authentic, it must resolutely face its future. Um, so it, there is, there is a, 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 it takes a, a, an act of the will, but it's a strange kind of will because it's a, it's a willing to surrender itself to its own capacity to be and so forth. It, it, the, later on, Heidegger will tell us that there's a resolution in Gelassenheit, which is a letting be. So it's, but it's being overdetermined in this moment again by the political context. So there's a kind of decisionism which sounds, you know, a heroic decisionism which is uh, all too uh, resonant in, in the moment. But Heidegger is pretty insistent with his use of this word later on. Um, uh, and suddenly I'm getting confused. In, in the word resolution there is Entschlossenheit, but it's also Eschlossenheit. The German speakers, uh, if you, if you, it, it's Entschlossenheit, isn't it resolution? Yeah. And, I'm sorry, uh, but, Entschlossenheit would be un, it would be opening up. Right? So resolution, it's not it's not a closing of will, it's an opening uh, to one's own essence. Like in the same way that resolve is, would be cognate with dissolve, I would suspect. Uh, okay. Resolve, yes. like to have resolve, it is also cognate with dissolve. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you're taking a part in the I'm sorry, can you hear? It seems teleological at first. Like, yeah, like but, but again, in entschlossen means an unclosing, mm -hmm. right? So schlossen is, is a, a, a schlossen would be a closedness. Mm -hmm. Entschlossen would be, would mean, you know, opening oneself. So, um, then opening oneself to one's being and one's finitude and so on and so forth. So it's not simply, a, you know, that kind of willful determination. Okay, so uh, so we we go through this um, this gigantomachia and this of uh, this fighting of the battle between world and earth in this mythic way, and then he comes to the question of truth, which is at page fifty in my text. From this repose of the work, we can now first see what is at work in the work. Forty-eight, second, third part. Thank you. What's just the first sentence of the paragraph or so? From this repose of the work, we can now first see what is at work in the work. Until now, this is a short paragraph, until now it was a merely provisional assertion that in artwork the truth is set to work. In what way does truth happen in the work being of the work? It is now, how does truth happen in the fighting of the battle between world and earth? What is truth? Heidegger will, um, I, I, I'll trust that you read these pages. Um, I won't go into them. Um, very closely. I, I, I don't really believe that's necessary um, in this context because I don't think he's I don't think he's doing that much at this point. He's evoking his own work with the notion of aletheia and truth, and he is making a move which he's already made. Um, I, I called your attention to it. I can't remember where, but I called your attention to it. The move being to say that truth, as we understand it, in the um, <coughs> modern metaphysics as, an, as correctness or adequation between the representation and the thing represented. Um, 
Uh, that notion of truth, or its correspondence, requires that that which we seek to be truthful about in a proposition uh, have to disclose itself. The thing, the thing must give itself to us if we are to be able to make any true proposition about it. There must be the relation between, um, well, human being in this case, self and thing must already have occurred if there is to be anything like a correct um, account. So, if, if truth is, is um, uh, understood in terms of rectitude or, or precise correspondence uh, or the adequacy of a, of, a, of a representation in relation to the thing represented, um, Heidegger doesn't, doesn't dismiss such a notion of truth. He doesn't, he doesn't suggest that this is wrong. He simply says this presupposes something else, which is this event by which um, a thing is disclosed to us. And so he's, in effect, asking us to move back to understand this way in which this disclosure happens. And he makes the very important point for us here that um, in order for us to be, tr you know, to, to represent something truthfully or to say something uh, truthful about something and, uh, along the lines of correspondence, not only must that thing be disclosed in some way, but the entire, <coughs> as he says, the entire world within that thing appears, must itself be disclosed. We don't ever have relation to one thing without that relational context that we've been talking about. So there must be the disclosure of something like world in order for there to be a relation to an individual thing that could then be in, be, uh, uh, to which we could then seek to conform in some form of proposition or some sort of saying. <coughs> so that would then demand the relation between world and world. I mean, yes, I mean, it's not just world, it's world and earth, that's right. So as he says, um, I'm, I just jumped to, I'm on page 52 here, but it is not we who presuppose the unconcealedness of beings, rather the unconcealedness of beings. End being, of 50. End of 50, thank you. End of 50. It is not we who presuppose the unconcealedness of beings, rather the unconcealedness of beings, being. Notice how he's collapsed the truth of being here. Right? And so again, he, he works by often kind of shorthand, and you have to uh, sort of allow for that, and not freak out too much trying to pin down what he means at any given moment. <clears throat> Truth is, you know, as he defines it, and, and how, he, how he uses it in shorthand, is the unconcealedness of beings in their being. <laughs> so, um, anyway. The unconcealedness of beings puts us into such a condition of being that in our representation we always remain installed within installed within and in attendance upon unconcealedness. Not only must that in conformity with which a cognition orders itself be already in some way unconcealed, the entire realm in which this conforming to something goes on must already occur as a whole in the unconcealed. And he, as he insists in the first part of this, he says, uh, you know, it's not we who presuppose unconcealedness. Unconcealedness, in a certain sense, presupposes, if we think about this sort of a, a placing, a, po a posing or a moving, presupposes us. Uh, so in other words, we are taken into this relation. It's not as though this is happening as a spectacle before us, as though we were outside it. No. We too are part of this movement by which um, things come forth in, in disclosure. Um, we can't count ourselves out in this process. The, the Dasein is, is part of this process. So self and thing are disclosed together. And we always must think selfhood from this relation. So again, I want, want to insist, he's not saying that there is no such thing as correctness or truth in that, um, that sense he's trying to delimit the way. He's simply saying that that's not the whole of truth, and that, that there is this more, more essential, in the, in the strongest sense, there is this more essential movement which he will come to define now as a relation of concealing and unconcealing. <clears throat> and then, how does this take place, he asks, in the next paragraph. <coughs> and he goes, things are, and human beings, gifts and sacrifices are, animals and plants are, equipment and works are. That which is, the particular being stands in being. Through being, there passes a veiled destiny that is ordained between the godly and the counter-godly. There is much in being that man cannot master, 
There is but little that comes to be known. What is known remains inexact, what is mastered and secure. What is, is never of our making, or even merely the product of our minds, as it might all too easily seem. When we contemplate this whole as one, then we apprehend, so it appears, all it is, though we grasp it crudely enough. So he seems to be trying to evoke here um, all of being in the sense of what is, that which I called the ontic a few moments ago, um, with regard to Bajra, the ontic. You, you will have heard of in Heidegger the ontico ontological difference. Um, ontic referring to the, the realm of beings, or what is, ontological referring to the being of those beings. And he sometimes says the being of being itself. So, what he has named here is the entire realm of beings, or what is. But he says that for this realm to open, there must be this event of truth. And so he says, and yet, beyond what is, not away from it, but before it, there is still something else that happens. In the midst of beings as a whole, an open place occurs. There is a clearing, lichtung, a lighting. Thought of in reference to what is to beings, this clearing is in a greater degree than our beings. I'm not going to comment on this, but it's really very interesting. He has a, um, almost a, a scale of power <laughs> to think about uh, being. Um, but he goes on, This open center is therefore not surrounded by what is. Rather, the lighting center itself encircles all that is, like the nothing which we scarcely know. So if the realm that he's described in the preceding paragraph is the realm of what is, this event is no thing that is. It is, in that respect, nothing. Um, or other than what is. And hence, we, we need to be talking about something like difference, to talk about what happens in truth. He doesn't use the phrase nothing very much um, anymore. He did it more around 1929, 1930, but um, still he wants to emphasize that Truth is no thing that is, um, if we follow that last paragraph. And he continues then, I will, oh gosh, it's getting late. For the next, sec the next, the next paragraphs are absolutely wonderful. <clears throat> because there he engages Plato. Let me, let me urge you to reread that um, before we start tomorrow. Um, Which, but well, actually, you should reread everything constantly over and over. But um, <laughs> I'm referring to the, uh, on page 53, where I am, so it must be about 52, 51, where you, you see the, the, set, the paragraph that begins, Beings refuse themselves to us. Yeah. 52. 52. Well, that's why he defines consumer. Yeah. And I urge you to look carefully at that description because he is um, uh, he, he is probably commenting on Plato's notion of mimesis. Oh, mimesis. I have a question um, because Heidegger wrote a text on Plato's case. Yes. And I'm trying to find it again, but I don't know where it is. Uh, uh, um, I think that um, so, so I he, think he comes back to it more than once, but I think it's in the in the. Um, <coughs> it's the essay on truth of about 1932. Uh, I think it's called The Essence of Truth. He comes back to it more than once. Um, he comes back to it in the Nietzsche lectures. Uh, but, no, anyway, that's, that's an important reference. Um, I also want to go back, if, if, for those of you who have basic writings, if you can look at it, what is metaphysics? This is a very interesting passage, which is pertinent for us. Um, my, my text, this, this version of basic writings is page 101. I just, for those of you who have the reference, I'll, I'll come back to it. I'll read it myself tomorrow, so don't worry about it. But if you want to take a look at it in advance, that's, that's what it is. Um, 101 of what is metaphysics? Of being, in, uh, yeah, what is metaphysics and basic writings? And there he's, he's talking about, um, he, he moves from this question of world and earth again to concealment and unconcealment and starts talking about um, how concealment works in the event of truth in a, in a really interesting way. So we have both his relation to Plato and the Platonic notion of mimesis, which is uh, um, 
I'm very puzzled. No one ever talks about this, but it seems to me extremely important in this text. I mean, how could, how could Heidegger, writing about art, not be talking about Plato and Mimesis? But, but anyway, here it is. And um, at the same time, it's a very interesting statement about, um, about the way in which this clearing works. So that's where I will pick up tomorrow. And uh, as I say, this is, this, is a, this is an interesting part. Um, and um, let me see. Yes, then we'll, I'll, I'll try to push on. We'll, we go tomorrow to our fifth day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're doing okay. Not to worry. So where is it? Page one hundred and one. Look, if if you don't have if you don't have this edition, don't worry about it. Or you do have it. The, the paragraph that I'm looking at is it starts out in anxiety. We say one feels ill at ease, and then you continue a, a couple of paragraphs. <laughs>